What's up, Los Angeles? It's me, your host, Casey Diaz of the the Shot Collar Podcast. Hey, um, I just came back from Alabama from having some uh, bits, biscuits and gravy. We don't have that in Los Angeles. They attempt to do that in LA, but uh, nothing like that. Alabama breakfast, man. Hey, it's good to see so many of you on social media and enjoying what we do here on the Shot Collar Podcast. Uh, just wanted to remind you, for those of you that, uh, you know, I want to, first of all, I want to thank you. Many of you are pouring in, not just your comments and your prayer, but you're also supporting this uh, podcast financially. And as you know, we are a uh, listener. Uh, well, you're, we're on your back as far as um, you donating to this podcast. And we just want to say thank you so much for for all the support, the financial support, your generosity to this place. And we're going to keep on doing what we're doing and bringing you great stories like the one today. And today, you know, I don't know if you um, know or aware, but the month of January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. It's every January. Um, in fact, I didn't know this until about a couple of months ago uh, when I was looking through my guest and her uh, feed on social media and I started to see, you know, what this young lady does. And uh, she, she speaks at so many events and, and very involved in human trafficking and, and the awareness of that. Uh, a tremendous help to her community. And when I saw that, I said to myself, I, I gotta reach out and see, you know, um, how I can get her to this podcast. And the cool part is, when I reached out to her, uh, she said, that is so funny because I was just about to hit you up and see if there was a way of getting on the podcast. So it was God ordained for sure. And uh, I'm just so happy uh, that she is here. And, you know, let me just introduce you, uh, introduce to you Sandy Esparza. And uh, thank you so much for being here, uh, Sandy. Um, you do tremendous work out there. Uh, we see it, I see it. And uh, you have quite a story. And one of the things that w when I, initially reached out to you. Uh, I actually was asking you, you know, is, do you have any connection with Zoe? Because that's, that's where I saw you going into, into this ministry. And, and basically, I was just going to say, do you know anybody that I can interview there and um, see what could happen out of that? And then your response was, you know, what, what I just said. And I, I thought, wow, man, that, that is so cool. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, Sandy, um, what's your story? Thank you for having me, Casey. Um, that was a great introduction. Uh, and it, it is so crazy how we both were on that same, just in sync. And I love how God works things out like that. But I'm so grateful just to be here today. And man, my story, well, a lot of the reason that, or the only reason that I do the work that I do uh, in the human trafficking realm really is because I'm a survivor of trafficking and um, that goes back to the 90s. Uh, I'm born and raised in LA. I'm a South Central girl um, and I was first trafficked when I was 14. Wow. So I was trafficked for seven years until I was 21 uh, and that was a mixture of trafficking and exploitation just across a lot of different playing fields in the game. So um, but, you know, I think what a lot of people don't realize is even uh, when youth are in these positions of being trafficked, or even for myself, there's so much that preps you for that. Um, when I think about my story, I remember just having this term come to mind that I was prepped for profit, even as like a younger girl. You know, I had already been molested and sexually abused when I was younger by family members and um, just friends of the family or babysitters and things like that like someone had already crossed all these boundaries with me and my life and my body and I was just really broken you know and and people don't realize that there's so many things that are this funnel that kind of prep 
these young kids, at risk youth yeah. that I work with to kind of be set up. Like there's this setup that happens and it's easy pickings for pimps, for traffickers, you know, to go after kids that are pretty broken. Yeah. And, 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 and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but uh, most of the um, most of these events, um, you call it prepping or setting up. A lot of that happens I mean, by family members, oh, yeah. very close friends. That's, that's a usually stat. the case, that's right? That's a statistic. Like, yeah. just that's a fact that most kids that are trafficked or exploited, it happens by someone they know. That's it's not, horrible. you know, it's not this white van kidnapping. Yeah. You know, everything that Hollywood portrays and like what you think about it sure that stuff happens but that that isn't the majority of it it really is usually by people that you know that you that are your close friends or family or a friend of the family you know there's grooming that happens over certain periods and things like that so it's it's by those closest to you which is the sad part and so walk us through because you, you just said from 14 to 21 yeah uh, that's a seven years of. That's a long time. I, I would say torture. I mean, I don't want to. There's no dumbing that down. I mean, that's. Yeah. It's torture. I mean, you, you're a young lady, fourteen year. I have a fourteen year old son. We've all been there, right? Fourteen years of age. Uh, for me, different story, but. But when it comes to this, you know, I, I always look at the mentality of people that do this. Because this is the, 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 the bottom of the barrel. This is the lowest of the low it, when it comes to this type of crime, because that's what it is. And, and taking vulnerable children and then using them the way they do. Walk us through that experience for you, because I mean, there's, uh, you know, and, and I asked you, I, uh, I sent you an email and I'm, I'm, I want to be very careful and respectful uh, to your story as well, because this is not, you know, uh, this is not a robbery. This is not mm -hmm. some carjacking story. This has, it's, it's very personal. And uh, I always try to stay within the lines of or the parameters of our guests here. Uh, some things they don't want to share. Sometimes they, you know, they want to stay away from stuff. As as you want to share, how does that start? Where does that begin at 14 for you? Yeah, oh, thank you for just the sensitivity in that. Um, I think that speaks volumes of just your heart, but um, just to speak into that a little bit, I'm, I'm very open and transparent and unfiltered is how I move in my life. I feel like God gifted me that, um, and he certainly didn't save me to be silent. Uh, so I think part of the problem with human trafficking awareness is that people don't want to know and it's it is ugly Right. Yeah. It is dark. It is the lowest of the low um, But until we open our eyes and open our ears and our hearts to what's really going on in our backyard With our children with our communities Then you're not going to get it and you're not going to be able to move into action and do something about it So I think it's really important to hear those unfiltered versions yeah. and what that really looks like and how it isn't what you think it looks like. And it's the same way that I operate with the youth that I work with, uh, which are being, who are being trafficked and exploited. And I tell them my story and I keep it all the way 100. You know, like, we're, this is what it is, this is what it was, and they connect with that. People connect yeah. with the reality of things um, when they know you're being genuine. And I think that's how you make change. Yeah. So, um, how did that start at 14? Um, you know, I kind of came to this place, like I said, I had already been abused and molested and um, I lived at home with a single mom who was very intense, you know, she was just kind of your typical authoritative parent, ruled with an iron fist, you know, uh, I was terrified of her probably until I was 13 and then God created me very strong willed, you know, and um, I just got real brave, like apparently when I was, and I have a 14 year old daughter and a 12 year old, so I get it. But, um, you know, I started to push back a lot, but you know, we had like, I don't want to say typical cause maybe not everybody experiences it, but like it was Latina mom who didn't play any kind of games. And she, you know, we got the beatings and all the things. Um, 
But I think what impacted me most was there was a lot of emotional abuse and verbal abuse and just a lot of belittling. And I just felt so small and like worthless. And that was at the hands of my mother, you know, and just how she treated me and all of that. Like it just, it didn't feel, aside from the discipline, yeah. like that part really broke me. So here I was, this very vulnerable, broken, um, girl who just need, wanted love. I just wanted love and nurture and care. And to this day, like my mom still is not any of those things, even as a grandma and all that. And some people are just not built like that, right? Mm -hmm. So I've learned how to give her grace and just meet her where she's at. But um, that caused me really to have such a tough relationship with my mom. We were always at odds. And then she just got tired one day and she was like, I'm good, like I'm not doing this anymore. So she handed me over to DCFS, oh, which man. back in the day, you could do that. You could just be like, I'm tired of my kid. Like, I don't I don't wanna deal with them. Like, go ahead and take them. It was a thing, you know, and uh, that's what she did. So at uh, almost 14, I went into the system for no reason other than I was rebellious, mm -hmm. right? And I wasn't listening and all these things, but I was a straight A student. I was gifted in all the honors classes, you know, and a lot of that came from just my mom, you know, perfect attendance. There was this perfection thing um, that we always had to live up to. And I was just tired. I, I wasn't allowed to have friends. Like there was so much restriction um, that I felt like I was in chains. Like I felt like I was in jail. And so when she put me in the system, that was it. Like I just, went off the deep end and I ran away. I didn't want to go to a foster home, you know, I didn't. When you've grown up your whole life with your parent, like you don't even know what what that is. The, the level of rejection that I felt of somebody like not being wanted, right? Like just, you're, you're this throwaway kid. Like, and, and I'm one of six. So my mom legit, like she was picking and choosing which ones she wanted to keep because there was another brother that you know oh so just what that does to you people don't realize like the rejection that comes with that but that does to your confidence your self-esteem just all the things as a kid you know like what are you to do i run away and i'd say maybe a little over 24 hours i had a friend who was also a runaway um, he was like, I have a friend, you can stay with her, like, you don't have to sleep on the street. And I didn't, you know, I was, I was hanging out with people. I was like gang affiliated and like all doing all the little things, but I didn't, I really didn't know anything about the streets yet. Like I wasn't all the way about that life. Like I still had a home I had to go to and like my mom was real. Um, so I didn't want to sleep on the street, but I also know I couldn't go back home. I'm now... A part of the system right like I don't even belong to my mom anymore and so I was like yeah sure I'll go I'll go stay with her that sounds great so he takes me to her house and it's not that far from where my mom lives uh, if you're familiar with the slots and swap me it's just right behind there you have done that. well and it's still there yeah, um, it now it's called the slots and mall oh got it <laughs> the swap me yeah, back then exactly. uh you know in the 90s um so this lady she lives behind uh this swap. she lived behind the swap me uh and i go stay with her she's beautiful i mean this woman she was around my mom's age she just was gorgeous and she had this amazing personality and she just took me right in and i i'll tell you i gravitated to her everything i probably always wanted in a mom that was her. Yeah. And so there's another stigma uh, that a lot, most traffickers are men. And my first trafficker was a woman. My first pimp was a woman. Oh, man. And I had other women pimps later on in life too. So we'll get that, that uh, myth out of the way right away. Um, so everything was great. She was this, you know, really nice lady. She took care of me. She's giving me food. Really everything a mother is supposed to do in my eyes, right? She had little kids and so I naturally was helping take care of them. I had already done that. I've been, I'm telling you, I've been groomed to do that in my own home. Again, as Latinas, like we, I was the oldest girl and you gotta raise your siblings, you know, like it's a thing. Like you, you don't really experience childhood very much if you have that kind of parent. 
So I was a parent very early on, maybe 10 years old, nine years old, helping with my siblings, feeding them, bathing them, doing all the things. Um, I was pretty much responsible for them. So uh, that felt very natural to me and I was helping in that way. And that's what it was for about two months. So there wasn't any crazy- Alarm or red flags. No, no, not at all. It just, it just felt like, wow, this is my new home. Like I like it here. Like this woman cares for me. You know, she's giving me all my basic needs, mm -hmm. right? Like safety, security, food, shelter, all the things we need. Love. Love. Yeah. Um, and so that's what it was for all, although I quickly realized that she was hooked on something, mm -hmm. right? So she'd always go to the bathroom and do her thing, have me watch the kids, and she'd come out just like not the same person. So I hadn't done any hard drugs yet. You know, I was, I was your typical kid. Like I'd smoked some weed and cigarettes and drank some beer and stuff like that, um, but nothing crazy hard until then. And then one day she pulled me into the bathroom and she handed me a crack pipe. And I had no clue what that was. Like, I just didn't know. Yeah. I knew what crack was doing in my neighborhoods yeah. in the 80s and 90s. Like, I knew that it was sweeping and people were dying. Like, I did know that. Like, I'd watch the news and things like that. But I just didn't. I had no idea what it would do to me, like what it was really, any of that. So she has it to me and I was like, oh no, like I'm good. <laughs> like I'm not trying to do that, like I'm okay, you know? And she just kind of pressed in and was like, go ahead and take a hit. And I think this is another myth. Like there's so much that people think trafficking or like when you're in these situations that it's a choice and there's so much choice that is taken <clears throat> from you. Like when you're in positions of survival or intimidation or coercion or fraud or force, that comes in so many different forms yeah. other than somebody just snatching you up and saying, do this. You know, there's this level of manipulation and grooming and breaking down psychologically that happens, yeah. which is the, the bigger thing. And I always say, like, there was no amount of physical chains that... Could it, like even when my physical chains were released, I stayed in bondage psychologically for so many years after I left the life, just because that's the level of mental takedown that these traffickers really like. They show up with, they know what they're doing. They're very intentional. Yeah. So, I didn't feel like I had a choice. Like this lady's been taking care of me. She's, she, you know, she's covering all my needs, all of that. I have to do what she tells me to do. It it, it almost feels like. You do it. What you do what they ask because it's almost owed to them. Oh yeah. You know, after all, 100%. they're housing you, they're feeding you, they're quote unquote loving you. You know, all, all these things line up, so it's almost like, and you're right. It, it is a psychological game because you you feel like if I don't, I'm letting them down. Oh yeah. I mean, this is what I I wanted at home, and I didn't, I wasn't getting that. Here comes this lady, and she's providing what. A 14 year old essentially is needing. Yeah. So if I don't do this, I let her down. Oh man. That's real. And and guess what? When they say, I've been feeding you, I've been taking care of you, I've been clothing you, I they're right. Yeah. It's it's not wrong. It's not wrong. They're telling you the truth. They're telling you the truth. And as a kid, because you're not fully developed yet, because you're still trying to understand how life even works, and it's so easy, you're so impressionable. That what do you do? Yeah. You know, it makes sense. It made sense in my 14 year old head. Yeah. And there was that pressure. There was that guilt trip. There was that, I owe this person. Like, mm -hmm. I can't say no to her. And and that was the first night I took my first hit of crack. First 14 year old, tiny little, probably uh, all of 90 pounds. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I'd say by the end of that week, I was fully hooked on it. Didn't take them. It doesn't take long. Um, and then that's that's all I was doing within maybe the week or two, um, fully addicted to crack. And then that's when the shift happened. And that's another thing that traffickers will use drugs as a form of just luring or keeping you at bay, yeah. like for you to do what you need to do. They know exactly what's, what, what they're doing. And it almost sounds, um, it, 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 it's it's the same way in in some sort of way with gang initiation 
they 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 groom you they, they mm -hmm. you know these things are provided for you whether it's partying whether it's a good time it all looks like fun but there is a plan and it's dark and it's wicked uh, what they're about to do and this is where you find yourself where it's that shift starts to happen and what takes place so the shift happens when um one day she just says we don't have any money and we don't have any dope and i'm gonna need you to go with this guy oh, and just do whatever he needs you to do and then we can get what we need and i had no idea right what she's talking about like i just haven't been in the streets like that yeah. yet you know and um i start kind of just arguing back like what do you mean like go with who like i start asking all these questions um but then i also have i'm fiending you know i also have this the chemical inside this of chemical inside of me that that is asking for more like my body is also having a reaction and so is hers and so of course i didn't put that together at the time but um she's just like okay well like when i start pushing back a little bit she's like well then we're both just not gonna have any anything to do you know like we're not gonna have any money we're not gonna are you fine with that like it was just a whole guilt trip yeah. um i kept arguing back and that's the first time i caught a backhand across my face oh, and wow. up until then she'd been the nicest person and we're a couple months in mind you right <laughs> like another myth like this could very well happen. I've seen it happen in 24 hours, 48 hours, where they do snatch you up and then you're, you're, they're putting you on the street in 24 hours, you know? But I've also seen this play out over a long period of time. And don't get it twisted. Like pimps, traffickers, they will invest their time and their energy and their intention because they know that the profit will be worth it. Yeah. And they will take their time. Like they'll be, one of my youth called them shapeshifters. Mm -hmm. They just become who they need to become until they need you, you know, they get you where they need you. So it's the first time she slapped me. Um, and that was familiar to me because my mom used to do that all the time. Uh, that was like her favorite thing to do, was just awful, just to get slapped across the face. Um, so then that was a big trigger for me. And then I had fear as soon as she hit me I went back to being that little scared girl with my mom and then it was like nothing had changed and uh, again I felt in that corner like I can't say no I can't because she brought all the things up you've been staying here you're not pulling your own weight now like you're you don't work like you don't help me like it was a whole thing yeah. so now I was like whoa like what just happened and then that was it like I put my head down and just did whatever she told me to do and she ended up calling this guy he pulls up her her place was right uh right where the alley is so there was a window that opened up to the alley and I remember almost one day feeling like it was a drive-through type of situation oh. and so she'd open that little window and you know she was renting this like back house like a garage right yeah. it had been turned into just a little spot to live in um, so there weren't like real windows. It was just that little window and it was, it was tiny and she would open it. Cars would pull up. She'd talk to them. They'd give her money and then they would come around the corner, the side, and she would put me like, put me out, put me in the car. And so that first night, uh, I remember the guy, he was like the local dope dealer. Like I'd seen him before. She bought drugs from him before he knew who I was. Um, he knew I was a whole kid, you know, I was only 14. Um, and he didn't say anything, like she just put me in the car. He drove me down the street to some janky motel that is still there by, by the way that some of our youth have been um, raped in, some of the girls that I've worked with. And this, mind you, this is 20 years later. We're yeah. talking 20 something years later. Yeah. This is still a thing, same, same motel. And so he took me down to that motel and that was the first time I got raped. He just had his way with me and I thought I was gonna die. Like I just, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know anything about this life or what this was. Um, I mean, this dude was just, 
he was a grown man, you know, and I just remember being so scared and thinking I was going to die. Like, I thought he was going to kill me, and that wasn't it at all, and it was the most confusing moment, I think, for me, because when he was done with me, he, like, rubbed my back, patted me on the back, almost like, good job. Like, you'll keep telling me, you'll be fine, you'll be all right, you know, like, go ahead and get dressed, I'll take you back. He was, like, taking care of me after doing that. Like, he was offering me support and encouragement, and it was the weirdest thing for me. I just did not understand that dynamic, and I felt it was an instant full of, like, shame, you know, and... So many of our girls carry that like just the shame and the guilt like was this my fault like you know did I ask for this did I I should have never left home like all the things and he just drove me back and I got out of the car she gave me a pat on the back told me to go inside and then he they finished that transaction and then she came in and we smoked crack in the bathroom and that was the beginning of that then after that that was my job what, what year was this uh so i was 14 1998 you know um i, I don't know what 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 grown men grown men and, and, and i hate calling you i even hate calling them men because they're not that's definitely they're not to me, uh, they're cowards and they're opportunists. And um, you know, the, the '80s it was very wicked. And, and you know, for, for us, I mean, for me as a gang leader at that time, uh, I was already signed when, when that uh, when that in that year. But at that time, there was still that line that you didn't cross. And if you came into the Los Angeles County Jail on any kind of rap sheet like that, uh, it was going to be a bad day for that individual. I just can't wrap my head around what what makes a, an individual, a grown, a, a, an adult, do that to a child. Uh, there's there's no excuse to that. You know what you're doing. You, you know exactly what you're doing. You're manipulating, you're taking advantage of a, of a child. At 14, you're a child. You're a kid at that moment. And you're destroying them. The very fiber of their, their you're dehumanizing them. They, they're becoming objects in your, in, in, in your hands. <laughs> it, uh, one of the reasons that, uh, and I knew that this would be one of those interviews where I get, I'm the, the, many of you out there, you, you know my story in the whole nine yards. If it's one thing that I, that triggers me, one thing that, that just gets under my skin, it's any kind of crime against kids, man. And to this day, I, 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 I don't like getting into, you know, biblically, it, when you get in the flesh, you get angry, right? But this, it angers me. It's righteous anger. That's what I call it. Yeah, I mean, but but you know, it, it, it gets it. it <laughs> My goodness, man. It is. It's um. It's heavy, and it's still happening. It's alive and well. I'll tell you that. Yeah. You know, right here, in our in our backyard in L.A. Well, I, I did some research and, and I looked up all the the major cities that have this major major problem, and it's Chicago. It, it, and I wasn't surprised when I when I kind of went in and started looking into this. Where are the major cities that have this problem? I was not surprised by what I found. You're talking about Chicago. You're talking about Virginia. You're talking about Los Angeles, California. Sacramento is the highest. Uh, Sacramento. That that to me was like really. really? Yeah. That's what it said. Uh, and, and no, I mean really, you're uh, like shocked part, but. Uh, so California is number one. Yeah. In the nation. In the nation. 
like where we sit today yep. is no, we're number one. Like that's yep. not a good number one. No, it's not. And we hold the three biggest hubs in the nation, yep. which is Sacramento, LA, and San Diego. Yeah, exactly. And then Texas is number two. And then um, Texas. But uh, I think that that speaks volumes over what are we doing? Yeah. You know, what are we doing about this? Yeah. And right where we're sitting in LA. Besides being silent by politicians right. and, and people in power that run the state, it's almost like, uh, you know, they, they, they put it under the rug. Uh, you know, if nobody sees it, nobody's going to, right? But, but it's happening. And the other thing I found was that, uh, and, and uh, going back to what you said earlier, uh, you know, being in the foster pro program, 70, it said 75% of those that are, that are being human, uh, the, the part of the human trafficking, mm -hmm. the, the victims, come from the foster care. Yes, they do, and from the juvenile justice system. Yeah. Yeah. So all, 100% of the youth that I serve in LA come from DCFS or, or probation. You know, I, I have a, and I won't get into the details of this, but I have a particular DA uh, texted me yesterday with a case that he's about to get into. And DCFS, uh, I mean, the, the, there has to be some kind of reform that happens to this, to this the system is very broken. It's broken. Yeah, and Big it has time. been. It was when I was in the system 20 plus years ago, and it still is today. And we see that in one, how this issue is growing. It, yeah. It's sweeping the yeah. nation, and not only just the nation, but just LA. Mm -hmm. People have no idea. And, and, and you know, you, you end up going into a, a, a rabbit trail when, when you start doing this type of research because then you start. My eyes started opening up. Uh, I mean, you know, since I contacted you, I started looking into different things, and 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 it's right underneath our nose. Yeah. It's not even hiding anymore. It really isn't because the sporting events—that's a huge thing. Uh, the Super Bowl, World Series events. I mean, the, this is where it's happening oh, yeah. right in front of our eyes. High ticket. Every year, it's it's the biggest human trafficking situations that are happening, especially with the Super Bowl. And, and I never, you know, when, when you when, when I grow up, a ball game, that's the last thing I'm thinking about. And how many times did we walk right past it as it as it's happening, or as a transaction? I don't know what to call it. A, a handoff is happening. Now I'm like, you know. I mean, I got, I got two girls, I got a son. And it's not only young ladies that are going through this, right. correct? I mean, oh, yeah. you Zoe, also have young men. Oh yeah, Zoe, we've served both girls and boys. Oh, we man. have boys on our caseload, yes, 100%. I, I think um, there has to be more exposing of this kind of activity. The media doesn't want to touch it. It touches, at the surface of it. But it really, I mean, if, if, if they were about change, if they were about helping, it would be on the news daily with real time, a, a time lapse of what's happening in, in our backyards. But they don't do that, and, and, and I noticed that. I mean, you know, from time to time, there'll, there'll be a sting, they kind of cover it, and, and then, hey, uh, you know, the weather kind of thing. It's almost like, a, okay, we, we did our job, Let's get past this moment, this sad moment. But we can't do that any longer. And this is why I think this, this type of interview is so important. And I love your transparency. I love that you, you're just, you're raw, you know. Um, I want to talk about your faith in a little bit. One of the things that, that we, when we sat down and wrote this book, I think that the Christian community as a whole, we need to change way we look at things mm. because testimonies and it's not about uh, bragging what we what we came through or, or whatever the case is but I think that enough of the fluffiness enough of the you know watering it down 
because if we need to really work at something, if we need to expose something, we need to be wrong about it. And, you know, obviously, you know, with carefulness and, 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 and dignity to the victims and, and all that, uh, absolutely. But we need to be talking about things. And this is one arena that needs to be talked about in churches. If, if nowhere else, in churches. If nobody else is going to help, churches need to help. Pastors need to be involved. Ministries within the church need to have outreaches and, and, and help. And I know that there's some churches that do do that. Uh, the Drewing Center is, is one of them. They have an entire uh, building that, that actually that is dedicated to that. I don't know if you've yeah, spoken we, there. No, I haven't spoken there, but we um, do collaborate with them um, and refer a lot of our youth there. It's a great, great place. Yeah, yeah, I, I've uh, I've been there, and I love what they do. They they very. I mean, you can't even go into the to the hallways uh, for the protection of the young ladies and young men that are survivors in the, in those uh, in those uh, hallways. Uh, but you go through all this. How do you how, how do you you're a survivor. How do you survive through that? Man, so um, I didn't have God. I didn't know God yeah. um, quite yet at that point. Uh, you know, I was raised in, well, my mom said she was Catholic, but there wasn't any, there was a little bit of religion. You know, we had to go to church yeah. and like play the whole role thing, but I had never seen anyone actually have a relationship with God, I didn't even know anything about that. And once I was in that position, um, I did it. I was I was there for nine months. Um, it just it turned really ugly. I became a heavy, heavy crack addict, um, and just withered away. You know, in nine months, like I just wasn't even the same girl anymore. And um, part of what she used to break me down, which a lot of traffickers do, is she gave me a new identity. So I had a new name, a new name, a new birth date. And, and that is strategic. That is a tactic that traffickers use. They strip you of who you are and then they build you back up with who they want you to be. Um, and, and a lot of it is by repetition and just like drilling into your head who you're not anymore, you know, and who you need to be. So I heard a lot of nobody loves you, nobody cares for you because I was a missing you. Right, I was a runaway, um, and nobody was looking for me. And she made sure that I knew that as much as she could tell me, no, but you're worthless. You have no value. Nobody cares. Your own mom is not even looking for you. Like nobody even wants you. Like what? And then it was. I felt at the time it was true, right? So she stripped me of my identity and really like molded me into this other girl. So, and I think that's so telling because when I finally did escape from there, it was a full like runaway situation from there. It was the scariest night of my life. Um, I finally did leave. And I remember after that, I stayed running. I, I was fully in the streets after that. And like, I never went back home. I was so full of shame. I could not even fathom facing like my family or my mother. Where would I tell them? Where have I been for nine months? What have I been doing? Like there was no way I was gonna tell anyone that, so I stayed hiding. Like I just, and it was at that point after experiencing all of that that I made up my mind that God did not exist. There couldn't possibly be a God. Um, so at that point, at 15, I became a self-proclaimed atheist, and it was hardcore, like an angry atheist. Yeah. Um, and, and I just ran with that, like that's where I sat. And, you know, I felt like I was a fighter by nature. Like I was always, you know, that was the thing. I was always fighting everybody at that point. All my teenage years, I was known for like pulling knives out on people and putting hands on anyone and everyone. Like I just was a fighter, you know, and um, was fully in survival mode. So once I left there, uh, I stopped smoking crack, but then I became a meth addict in a cocaine addict for six years and um one i feel like that sometimes kept me alive like 
when I was in the street as much as I was, I like I couldn't afford to go to sleep. Mm-hmm. You know, like because you're getting raped, you're getting robbed, you're you know, I spent some some of my teenage years <clears throat> on Skid Row. I spent most of my teenage years in Hollywood just being a runaway with other runaways. Uh, I was in and out of foster homes all over LA. I was in and out of juvenile halls. I was just on this cycle, you know, just being funneled back, like always running away, um, always having new social workers. I went to like 10 different high schools. I never could make friends uh, because I just was constantly moving. But I think something that I understand now was even when I left just being in that house with that woman, I continued to use the same identity that she gave me. Like, I never went back to Sandy. And when I hear you say that, it only took a year for her to rob you of your identity. Nine months. Yeah. And not even that, because two months in was chill, yeah. right? So yeah. it's a pre- seven it's months. Pretend yeah. Kind of thing. Wow, man. It wasn't that hard. Yeah. No, it, it's not that hard to mold a child. No, I mean, it, it, you know, our brain's not even developed in what, till we're 25. Uh, and so at that age, you're, and, and if you're not hip with the streets, um, you know, that be, prior to that, you're, you're still living at home. Yeah. You, you, like you said, even though you're in South Central, and you, you, obviously if you're in South Central, you're in, you know what's happening outside your door. But not so much so as in this area. No. You know? And if you don't know who you are. Yeah. If you have not been brought up in a way that has instilled a solid foundation in you, who your identity is, what your identity is, and who your identity is in, then, man, that's easy pickings. Oh, yeah. Big you time. know? Yeah. So I, I never, never used Sandy again until I was an adult. I never went back to my real name. I continued so to... You, you were under a nickname all Yeah, time. unless I was in a group home or a foster home or juvenile, where, you know, where they yeah, have my records. Yeah. Um, anytime I was in the street or just moving all over LA, everybody got this other name. Like, that's who I was. That's who I then identified with after that. It's just who I was. So I ran with it. And uh, once I went to the streets, this was the first time I got caught up with a street pimp. I didn't know what that was again, right? Yeah. Now I've been in this house. This lady's been selling me out of her home. It's it's a very controlled environment. There was nobody else there except her kids, uh, just her and I. I still didn't know anything about the game. Like I didn't know yeah. about the streets. And so now here I am on the streets um, and I have this drug addiction. Now I'm a whole meth addict and a cocaine addict and I'm having to feed my addiction and then I get caught up with someone who ends up being a pimp who put me on Sunset Boulevard the first time I was out on the blade which is back then it was the tract Um, but that's the first time I experienced that and him like just not even really telling me what to do or like there were no instructions there were no like you're just thrown out there Um, And I know it's different for a lot of youth, but I had no idea what was going on. And he put me in this car and he's just like, whatever you do, just don't make sure they don't take you beyond this street, right? So I'm up in Hollywood, Sunset Boulevard, it's busy. Um, It was right uh, by this Denny's on Sunset, which is still there. It just was a high trafficking area. There were girls all over uh, walking the streets. And this guy drives up the hills and he passes that point where I'm not supposed to pass. I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do. Now I'm almost 16. And um, then he pulls over and he tries to rape me. He like grabs me by my hair, gets violent with me, pulls a knife out on me, puts it to my face, like presses it against my cheek. I'm freaking out. This is inside his car. This is inside of his car up in the hills. I'm by myself. I have no clue. Like, I just was clueless. I can't, I look back on it now and I'm just like, I don't even, like, I had, I was, I had no idea what was yeah. going on or even, you know, there are rules to the trafficking game and like all these things, but like nobody showed me anything. There was no coaching right? for that. There was no coaching for that. And there is coaching now, by the way, and I'm sure there was then, but I certainly didn't get it. Um, and 
you know, I, I think I started like crying or something. I'm telling them I'm a kid. I'm like, I just don't, I don't even remember like what I said, but he like cussed me out and like threw me out of his truck. Like didn't rape me, but like threw me out of the truck. And so now I'm on the sidewalk and he takes off and leaves me there. And now I've got to come walk down from the hills back to Sunset Boulevard, which took me forever. And then when I got back down and met with my trafficker, I got slapped across the face. Like I was reprimanded, right? Like if something was my fault, it's just so confusing for a child like to be in these positions. Um, and again, it's part of the breakdown, but uh, I ended up like running away from him. And so that was kind of my MO at that point. I was just a runner. Like I wouldn't, as soon as somebody was treating me bad or putting their hands on me and you know, all of those things, or I caught wind, like he didn't know anything that had happened to me before. So once I caught wind of like what was happening, I was like, I gotta go. And so I'd wait for him, like I, he went to sleep at night in the motel, they all, all the pimps rent motels, like on the strip. And as soon as he went to sleep, I, I booked it, yeah, I ran. And I just go to another part of the city and I was just always moving. Nobody ever knew who I really was, always using fake identities, fake names. Like that's just what I did. I, I just kept moving to stay alive, really. So you didn't know where you're sleeping oh, from no. one night to the other. No, no. And, and there is really no comfort in even when I say sleep with this, you know, it, that's what normal, you know, kids at that age, they go home, they have a good night's sleep. This is this is so far away from you that you just don't know where you're gonna land from moment no. to moment. That's probably the thing I remember the least is sleeping. I, I don't I just don't remember a lot of rest or a lot of sleep. Um and again I was I was heavy, like a heavy meth addict at that point. And in a way like I felt like that was survival for me. And a lot of the girls that I work with are on meth and you know so even when i talk with them and you know when i when i sit with them they know my whole story like i'm just laying it out and we can have those organic conversations but most of the time i'm like i get it i'm like i feel you you know like sometimes they're like man i don't think i would have survived if i was sober and i'm like word you know like there's just you have to come outside of yourself so much because once you're sober and you cross, start to process everything that's yeah, been happening to you or the situation you're in, it's it's unbearable. It's yeah. so tormenting aside from the actual physical torture of it all. It, your mind, man, it, it will take you out in those situations. Yeah, and it's almost like understandable when, when, you, when you said, um, you know, if it wasn't for the methamphetamine, the cocaine usage, in a strange way that helped you, I can see, I can see why now. I mean, that, yeah. that, that's it's you're medicating the emotion, the feeling, the trauma. It, it, it's a big giant band aid uh, for those moments, and, and really, what it's really doing is digging the deeper holes. Oh yeah, and, and you're going darker and darker. Oh yeah. Know. And I think that's really, sometimes I notice it's hard for people to like digest because yeah. I am really honest about that. Like, listen, I, I was on drugs. I was trying to survive, yeah. right? And a lot of, like a lot of my girls say that. And I don't ever want to dismiss that because I've been there yeah. and I know what that feels like. Yeah. And I know, like, you just got to do what you got to do sometimes, yeah. you know, when you're in that position. And I think sometimes it's hard for people that haven't been in it to understand. Yeah. Like, well, why didn't you just, you know, yeah. that just to say that is, is crazy yeah. because it's just not that kind of situation. And even when, you know, I talk to the girls, I'm like, you know, listen, I get that. But I also didn't have God at that time. I didn't know God, yeah. you know, so I was trying to find all these other ways to try to save myself yeah. and that's just not what it is like that's not going to work for you so okay baby girl i know you're trying to you know make it out in these streets smoking meth every day but can we bring that down to like three days a week you know like i'm all about harm reduction like it's it's these baby steps yeah. where they're still alive i can't save them you can't save them are you going to pull them out and take them to your house you know what i mean like 
there's so much reality that has to go into walking with them, walking beside them and not judging them and making sure that you're just listening and you're someone who's like, you know what, I'm here with you, I'm walking with you. And as long as I'm around, I'm I'm just saying, I'm gonna fight for you to come out of this, yeah. but I can't save you. Yeah. And I, I think that, that that's the other thing that we need to understand as, as believers, right? Sometimes we do more harm by talking. By, oh no, you, you, could, you could quit that now. Or you could stop that now. That behavior could stop now. Not really understanding the situation that's at hand. Uh, it's almost like telling somebody that just lost their baby, their, their son, their daughter, and, and, you know, in a violent whatever. And you say, oh, you know, well, I'll, you know, just pray about it. Or it, you do so much more harm. I think it's best when you don't understand the situation. It's best to be become a listener rather than a talker. Yeah. At that moment, because you're gonna you're gonna do more wounding than than healing to somebody at yeah. that point. You know. And I like what you're saying is, you know, you can't save nobody. And yeah. you're right. We can't. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Right. That's the job of God, that, that he's the one that does the cleaning. He's the one that does the healing. He's the one that has the perfect right things to say to us in moments of trauma. And I want to talk about that part of your life because, you know, you spend seven years of, of just, I can't, <laughs> I can't even believe, I can't even like fathom that kind of torture in a young lady, in a human being. And I can't even begin to put things in, into perspective in, in that case though. But you become a young atheist, you, you hate God, and, and I get that. I get that because I, I could only imagine you, you know, where's God in all this? Yeah. Where's God in all this? But something happens to you somewhere and God comes in the picture. How does that take place? Uh, so that didn't happen until I was 31. Holy <laughs> shamoli. Yes. No, God did not. I, I, didn't, I didn't search for God until I was in my 30s. I still, I, I continued to be trafficked all my teenage years. I aged out of the system. And again, back then, a very broken system. There was no transitional services, transition. Now we have, you know, now we have a lot of okay. things for transitional age youth and all of that. There's a lot more resources, which I'm so grateful for. Um, but back then it was like, you're out, like it, there's a street, right? And, and what's so, the max out uh, for? Care. Well, I, I was emancipated at 17. So I just, they were just done with me, I think. I, I never stayed anywhere long really? enough to be stable. Like, I just, I ran from everywhere. The social worker would be driving me to the foster home, and I'm like, I don't even know why you're wasting your gas. I'm going to run away as soon as you open this door. And now we have youth that, like, jump out of the car while the car is moving. Like, they're just out, you know? So it wasn't... I probably was just a big headache and they yeah. were like all right man like you've been on your own like just go and have a good life um so i was done and again had nowhere to go had no family no friends nothing i was always on my own still on drugs i'd gotten into a lot of trouble in la uh, i'd have done a lot of damage and so i i was like if i stay in la i'm gonna die like somebody's gonna kill me like that's just the thing. I had had some like really close encounters. I had had an overdose. I had all these things that were making me feel like I'm gonna die soon. Yeah. Um. So let me move, right? That was my thing. Like I gotta, I gotta keep moving. Yeah. So I left LA, which was really hard for me because I had this weird, crazy love for LA, you know. And it's all you know. It's all I know. Uh, just inner city life like that was yeah. it. I didn't even know there was anything over the hill right in on the 405 I thought it was dirt. <laughs> I just I just have I just said this to somebody uh, and, and it, it, When they when I mentioned that most of us that come out of South Central the Grand Park District Watts Compton We don't go past form a four mile radius and, and 
they almost looked at me like skeptical. No, I can't be. Uh, did, just on a side note, did you were you aware that there was a beach just down the street? Did you even go to the beach throughout that time? Oh, then my teenage years? No. I remember when I was younger, my mom would take us to yeah. the beach, but not during that time. No, yeah. never. I just stayed in this... What was familiar. Yeah, that's it. Which is what we gravitate to as yeah. human beings. Just the comfortable, the normal, the familiar. Yeah, we know this street, we know this right. restaurant, whatever, this, this kickback. Yeah. So uh, I made the decision to leave L.A., and I moved to the San Fernando Valley, which I knew is where my mother lived, even though she wanted nothing to do with me. Oh, wow. I didn't have a relationship with her. Uh, my siblings had all like grown up at that point, and I just didn't talk to anybody. Nobody talked to me. My family didn't talk to me. Um, I just was I was very scorned. I was very bitter, very resentful. Um, I really just hated everybody, yeah. and I made sure people knew that everywhere I went. Uh, so I moved to the valley, and I meet a guy, and uh, I think he's you know lovely and he's nice and it and he becomes my boyfriend and i think he loves me and i think i love him and all this and uh he takes me to a strip club one night and so starts my third season of a different wow. form of exploitation and trafficking where i didn't know anything about strip clubs i didn't even know that was a whole like it was just a whole other world Right, so now I've, I've experienced trafficking out of a home, I've experienced trafficking on the streets, and now I'm in this establishment, like, what is this? And the way they sell you that is, you know, the empowerment and like, you know, you're in charge and like all these things. And again, that guy had no idea what I had been through in my previous oh, he, years. He, 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 he was clueless. He was clueless. So here I am now, and I've heard some of my youth say this too, and it makes so much sense to me now. Like, did I have some kind of target on my forehead that was saying, hey, I'm vulnerable, like, come take advantage of me? You know, like, really trying to put those things together, and what does that look like, and what is, like, how does one, because a lot of the times you think, like, you caused this. Yeah. Did I do this? Like, am I asking for this? Am I, you know, like, why does this keep coming to me? And I've heard some of my girls say that. And I believe that's the reason a lot of people don't talk, victims don't talk, because they do feel like... It's a shame of the feeling... Yeah, like, like it was their fault. Oh, some, yeah, and that's, a, and that's a trafficker, that is a tactic that traffickers use. They, yeah. The way that they manipulate you and the way they move, it makes you almost become a willing participant in your own exploitation. Yeah. And so then it's like, well, you wanted this, like you asked for this, yeah. you want to, we're a team, you want to make money, you want to, you know, so it just, the lines are so distorted and people don't realize like the coercion on the back end and the grooming and the manipulation and like the mind takedown that's happening. It's just beyond you. Like you can't even, how do you even keep up with it? Yeah. So now I'm in the strip club and here I go again, this this lady, like phase the house three. mom, phase three, um, she gives me a new name, right? And and this is why, like, I go so hard on, I share my faith with the girls all the time, and I'm just thankful to work, like, Zoe is a Christian organization, you know, and I work at another nonprofit, The Power Project, which we so freely share our faith, and I always say, like, I can't tell you about my story or my testimony without telling you about my Jesus. Like, they go hand in hand. You're going to just have to sit down and listen, you That's know? That's awesome. So, and, and I do that with the girls, and, it, and they really get it, and it moves them. And I think part of us, you know, as kingdom workers is to really meet people where they are. And we know, we know what God can do. Like, we know how big and powerful he is and mighty he is and how much he's still in the business of miracle working, I promise you that. And these youth don't know though. Yeah. You have to meet them where they are, you know? And what really worked for me was, what brought, a part of the thing that brought me to God was riding on the coattail of other people's big faith. Mm -hmm. People that had faith overflow, like abundance. Like I saw them living it out, like, I'm just gonna borrow a little bit of that so I can find my own. Yeah. You know, and I tell the girls too, like when they don't understand God and you know, I'm always talking about him. My whole life will tell you about God. And when they're lost and they're missing and they're, you know, we can't find them and 
we know they're in danger, I'm always dropping little text messages, even if they don't respond. I'm, if the spirit moves me, I'm like, hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying that you're safe. I'm praying that no harm comes to you. I'm, like, I'm shooting out the prayers. And when they reappear a week later, two weeks later, guess what? They're like, hey, miss, I saw your text messages. Thank you for praying for me. Like, I really felt that. Like, they come back and they, even though they don't respond, like, they're receiving. Yeah. Well, they see the consistency. Yeah. Me. And I think that's that's what you have to give to these young ladies that you're ministering to is you've been that road. You 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 know exactly what they're thinking, what they're feeling. And 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 you would have probably wished that somebody was wow. texting you and, and giving you something, something other than victimizing you further. Yeah. A hundred percent. I I I mean, the only thing I try to do is to be who I needed yeah. when I was a teenager. Like, that's it. And and so far, that seems to be where God wants me. And so, circling back, I'm in the strip clubs now. I get a new identity, which is something very natural for me and normal at this point. I can easily fall into any name, as long as it's not Sandy. Right? And I don't go back yeah. to her. Nobody even knows my real name. And so here I go in the strip club, and then that journey starts. I stay stuck there for three years, coming across a lot of different pins. Then I experience a whole other form of trafficking, and this is what we're talking about, what they don't show on the news and all these things. I'm being bought by celebrities, by a whole, it's in a whole other playing field, oh, right? So even people that we love and respect right police officers teachers pastors they're all coming through the door at the strip club so that further damaged my view of humanity right and and god, I, and god and all the things because especially when you see that you know i was seeing like the priests and things like that and like i smile and smirk because it's just so beyond what anybody can grasp, yeah. you know, and because the reality, like it, it'll, it'll shake you. Yeah. Well, these, these are people that are, that society looks and says, Oh, they're first responders. They're, they're safe they're, people. They're safe people. They're yeah. caring people. Right. And, and they and, are. And I want to, I want to make sure yeah. that I say that they're, they're probably are more yeah. good ones than bad, bad ones. ones. Yeah. But when you're that young and you've experienced all the it damages things, you. Yeah, I was just like, I cannot with humans. You yeah. know? I was so done with just people. Yeah. Um, and the way it calluses your heart mm. is, oh man, I, I just, I was so hard. I was such a hard woman. And I had been, that like someone created that in me, you know, and, and I just couldn't shake it. And um, so I'm in the strip clubs and uh, here I meet a man, which... I think I see him and he's the most beautiful man I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and he's the, the bouncer. He's the security at the at the strip club. Uh, and also the DJ. Uh, and then FYI, just, just to ruin it, the, that man is my husband today. So 20 years later. Yeah. So I see this guy and I'm just like, wow, blown away. Uh, we end up becoming really great friends. He also works, right? This is sex industry. So he yeah. also works there. Um, and even looking back, like him as a DJ, everyone's profiting off of the girls, right? Everybody gets their cut. So even him, you know, participating in some of the exploitation from all of the girls that are working there, including myself, um, everyone gets paid out. It's so like this well-oiled machine. Um, but we end up just hitting it off, being really great friends for a while. Um, the person that was exploiting me ended up going to jail. And like for the first time, I just felt like I could leave. Like this is, I could just stop all of this and change my life. It's the first time I ever thought that. Um, I was still on drugs. Um, I was still just kind of trying to survive. I was living out of motels at that point. Uh, never didn't have like my own place or again no family no friends so 
um, any money I was making, I was just paying for motels, staying in like extended stays, which a lot of our youth do today. Like they live in motels or they're living on the street or in their cars and um, things like that. So I fall in love with this guy. We go out uh, for, for a date once and that was it. Like it was a wrap. I was like, I'm moving in with this guy, like that's it, you know? And, and he was like the first normal man that I had come across. Mm. Um, and that was it, like we both decided to leave, you know, trying to be in love in a strip club environment is yeah, real, that, that's a... <laughs> it's a little, it's a little challenging. <laughs> but, um, you know, there was just so much there that it, it was crazy because now looking back, I, it really was love that led me to God, and it was my desire for love. Uh, at that point, I thought it was from this man, you know, that I wanted and I so desired. Um, but it's really that same love that led me to real love, to true love, which was with God many years later. Um, but we both end up leaving the strip club. I, I throw all my, you know, you, when you're in a strip club, you have this duffel bag of all of your outfits and shoes and like all this nonsense and I, I toss it I chug it in the dumpster um, I change my phone number again I, I run I disappear yeah. it, it's just what I do and um, I was really determined to and you know what it was it was because I thought I had found love like real love and I think that's what everybody's looking for right I mean at, at, at the end of the day Every human being, that's all they want. That's all they want. And when we don't know any better what real genuine love looks like, we'll gravitate to a false sense of that. Yeah. And, and it leads uh, to a lot of harm. It does, it does. And, and a lot of our girls, that's all they want. Yeah. A lot of our youth and boys that we work with, they're just looking, you know, people really just desire to be fully known, fully seen, fully Validated. loved. Yeah. And so here I am thinking I found real love, like a, a good guy who doesn't know anything about my past. Yeah, so it's like a white page. He knows he met me in the strip club and he thought I was there as a choice because I wanted to be. He didn't know. He had seen like the guy, you know, would come and he'd see his car and all that. He never knew. You know, he was raised in the valley, kind of in a bubble, like very, you know, protected and all these things. Um, didn't really know a lot about that. And I certainly wasn't going to tell him. Yeah. Um, so he had no clue. And this was the first guy I told my real name to. Like, it was a really big deal. Yeah. Um, so I end up leaving because I think I found true love. I'm willing to kick the dope. I'm really, like all of it. Yeah. I'm just like, I don't care. I'll go cold turkey overnight. Like he didn't even know I was doing drugs. He had, been, had never done drugs. Oblivious. Yes. So here I am trying to figure out how I'm gonna, you know, manage all this stuff being with this guy now. Um, and I did have to just kick it like cold turkey like that to try to just, and all I did was sleep. Like, I remember later he told me, like, I had never seen anybody sleep that much before. And it felt like months. Yeah. Like, I don't know, a few months. Well, you had, you um, had no place to sleep for... For seven years. For seven years. He had no clue. Yeah. He And now I'm done with drugs, right? And I was an alcoholic, like, all the things. I couldn't go a day without any of that. Um, so here I am now trying to be, like, normal overnight. Yeah. And it just... I just slept like my body shut down yeah. and he was there like he just you know he just wrote that out with me he didn't understand it but he does understand it now obviously we've had all these conversations but um you know I just I just like my body just rested and I recovered and then one day I woke up and just felt brand new you know and try to pick up the pieces like I had gotten my high school diploma after I was 18. I've done like little baby step things. Yeah. Um, I was like, I'm gonna go out and get a regular job. I, I mean, I didn't know anything but the streets yeah. for so long. So now I just felt so lost. And this is another thing that keeps our youth going back to the life and being re-victimized and, and exploited again in traffic, even when they're adults, because 
they're not getting the the tools they need mm. the skills the job the skills the training they need i certainly didn't so you know if you don't have employable skills or no one's taught you how to you know have good healthy social conversations and how to interact with people and all of these like the real world stuff yeah. It's just overwhelming. It's just too much. It's, it's too much. Yeah. It's so much easier to just go back to what you're familiar yeah. with. It, and it's almost like a like a convict's um, mentality. You know, we we get paroled to the same place, and we have absolutely no training at whatsoever. And you know, getting that fast money, getting that fast whatever. Let's go that route because after all, this is too it's too much yeah. for me to try to retrain and relearn or even learn, period, uh, a, a different way of living, a normal way of living sounds too too far-fetched. Yeah. So uh, the, the re-offending keeps the revolving door at that point. Yeah, same, same in, in the trafficking wow. space. So even, you know, a lot of times when we do manage, we do work in prevention, rescue, and restoration. So even when they are taken out of the life and, you know, we do try to, help them with school and work and things like that, those challenges come. And yeah. one of the top questions that the youth in the life ask me is, Miss, did you ever think about going back? Like when I was out. Wow. And I'm 100% on that too. So I'm like, listen, I was a whole 30 year old woman with two toddlers thinking about going back to the strip club. Wow. So don't get it twisted. Like you better get your armor on right and get your mind right. Because when those thoughts come, you need to learn how to take that captive and like shoot that the other way. Yeah. So I have to keep it 100 with yeah. them. I was a, almost a decade out of the life. And when things got hard, and that was later in life, I separated with uh, from my husband for about seven months. That crept in. Like yeah. the enemy was everywhere. And I was 30 years old with kids. Like maybe I could just, if I just go I could solve all my financial problems yeah. right now. One yeah. weekend. Yeah. Like, that's real. Fast money. Fast money, because yeah. everything else is, now I'm a single mom for a short period, right? And I was just like, oh, okay, I need to figure something out. Um, so I made sure I'm, I'm honest with them too. Like just saying, oh, once you leave, everything will be great. Like, absolutely not. Yeah. That, that is not. And one thing I always tell them is, and I promise you 100%, I would not be how you see me today if it wasn't for God. I'd be right back there. Yeah. And yeah. that, I mean, it's always opportunities to bring him into it because it really is the only way, you know? And so I end up coming out, um, I'm with my husband, we're, we're just, we're not married at the time, but we both go get regular jobs because he's also been on this fast money track, yeah. right? Like it's, it's a whole other world and it really is all consuming when you know how fast you can just go make a up. few thousand dollars, yeah. and just, you know? So even the first, and I share this with my girls, like this in my first real job and my first paycheck after working for two weeks, minimum wage, I was like, this is not for me. Like I'm done. Yeah. This is not okay. Who yeah. lives off of this? Like, I just went on a whole <laughs> tangent. Like, how? This is abuse. You know, like, I, I don't understand. You know, no wonder everyone's so miserable. Like, I was just overwhelmed. I had no idea. Yeah. It was real world stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. 40 hours. <laughs> right. And even though, and I'll, and I'll share this all the time with my girls, even though I didn't get to keep all the money, I knew like the potential and I knew what was coming in and I knew like this is night and day yeah. the, no wonder you know so it's such a hard transition yeah it's such a hard transition and you know because it does mimic a lot of the life that you led even with fast money and things like yeah. that like it just it's really difficult you have to retrain yourself yeah. renew your mind like it's there's so much you have to come down off this cloud yeah and really humble yourself yeah. in contentment and like all these things yeah. that come into play, right? So I, I have so many opportunities to talk about that with the girls because that is a big question for them. Yeah. I, I don't think I could do that. I don't think I have a, they call it a square job, but 
you know, I'm like, well, yes, you can. And I'm successful and I'm doing fabulous. And guess what? I don't have to go sell my body for it. That is how we talk. Yeah. And they respond to that, yeah. you know. The straightforward like, approach always works yeah. with somebody that's lived that same yes. lifestyle. Yes. Big time. Which is why survivor advocacy, I think, is an is is very needed in this space and just the power of a testimony like yeah. you just can't yeah. you know so how do you come to, to christ so okay so we i live like this for about a decade and then comes all of the residual right all of everything that that life sort of planted in me and molded me into i'm still this very angry woman um i don't believe in god there's all these things and now i have a partner and I've never, I don't know how to be that, right? And so then uh, the relationship between my husband and I, we, we ended up getting married and we had two children, um, my mid twenties, and it, it was a very toxic. We were both very broken. We were, I stopped doing drugs, but we both became alcoholics. Mm -hmm. um, and there was just so much that we had that we had never unpacked and there was so much pride and so, like it just was a disaster it was a full like domestic violence situation for a long time um i hated him i hated everybody i had a hard time connecting with my children um and mostly because i i felt so unworthy of them you know my daughter was born first and i the fear that i had in having a daughter i could not even put it into words. I remember I just didn't even want to touch her. Wow. And when she was little and in like, I missed that period, you know, and certainly try to uh, do better now that I have God, but I just was so disconnected because I just, I just was like, I'm not worthy. Like I can't, they're so perfect, Yeah. you know? And I, I like my confidence level and like how I felt about myself and how I saw myself at that point, it was, still worthless you know I had never come out of that so it just did a lot of damage and so you know almost 10 years in or so or a few years in um, we were gonna get a divorce so here I am full circle I promised I would do better that I wouldn't be my mom that I wouldn't you know you you say yeah. all those things like I'm, I'm gonna be a better parent and all that um, and I wasn't you know I I was very broken and um, just had no direction, no guidance. Um, and my family fell apart. And um, so here we are with divorce papers signed and separated for seven months. And I went off the deep end in those seven months. Like all of a sudden, we're talking a decade later, as soon as I separate from my husband, you know, we're living in different areas, I have the kids. Um, all the people from my past, I, I happen to run into them. Of course. And I don't know God. I don't know anything yeah. about the spiritual realm or spiritual warfare yet. Yeah, I have yeah. no clue, right? I'm just going with with it, whatever. And at the time, I was an EMT, so I had been working on myself and trying to kind of figure out what I was going to do with my life. Like, I think I want to be a nurse. Like, I've always wanted to help people. Like, I'm, so I'm still doing these little things, you know, again, I was a fighter, like I, I never was just gonna lay down and die, yeah. you know? And so I had been doing little things to like better myself. And uh, I had been an EMT for a few years, working up to being a nurse. And I run into some old, old folks and a decade later, and they're still, they're still there, you know, they're still in it. And it was just like this, like, well, you should, let's go party. Let's go do this. Let's go, you know, and then there I went and it, and it was so fast. Like I just face planted so quickly. And then I was back in this position of actually having thoughts of going back to the strip club because I was struggling financially so much. Right. And now I have the potentially going to be a single mom and get a divorce and like all these things. And um, I was so angry and I was making my husband pay for it. You know, I was hurting him so much and I was like wilding out. It just was not okay. And I didn't know on his end, um, he started praying. And he was never, this is how much like 
just influence I had in the home. Like I was very authoritative. I had become that person. Um, you know, I disrespected my husband all the time, all these things. He was not allowed to, at the time, to speak of God. Like that wasn't a thing. His, I wouldn't let his mom take my children because I was scared she was gonna go baptize my kids. Like that's how serious it was. So he came from a believing background? He came from a Catholic home. Oh, okay. Yeah, his his mom is Catholic, you know, and she, she reads the word and goes to church and prays and all that. Um, but she was always pressing him for like the kids, they need to get baptized, they need to go to church. Yeah. And I was just like, Not having no, it. I was coming in like a wrecking ball, like cussing <clears throat> everybody out. And um, it just was, I, it was, you, I wouldn't have it, you know, and it was yeah. my home at the time, right? Like I was just very like bulldozing. Um, and so I didn't know that he was, he started praying. He had now been, he was this broken man now. He lost his wife and his children and, you know, life is falling apart. And, but our love was really that strong. Like our love was so strong. We'd always come back to each other, but there was so much we hadn't unpacked and fixed. And, yeah. you know, we didn't know God still. So I end up just having a horrible night where I just felt like the worst wife the worst mom the worst person um i wanted to kill myself and i had attempted suicide a few times in my life like i i just was brought back to this really dark place um especially when i had thoughts of going back to the life i was like i was 30 you know and i just felt so pathetic like i just felt like what kind of woman am i you know and again feeling like it's my fault or it's you know, all these thoughts, but it's this reprogramming that has to happen that I hadn't done, like I hadn't done the work. And so um, I, I really thought about killing myself and just leaving the kids to my husband and that was it. But I ended up at his door that night and I was like, I can't do this anymore. You know, like, I just want to start over. But if we can start over, I have to tell you some things. So that was the thing. Like, I've always been really straightforward, you know, and, and it is what it is. So I felt like we couldn't move forward unless I was like, this is what I've done these seven months that we've been apart. Like, I've just gone off the deep end, you know, and there was a lot of, there was adultery and there was drinking and partying and like just all this behavior that wasn't honoring my husband, right? And so I unpacked that on him and and he I was I was sure he was gonna be like, I'm done, we're not we're not doing that. Um and he had stuff on his end too that that he shared. Um but he didn't, you know, he he held me, we hugged, and we cried, and we were like, Okay, let's start over. But it has to look different because a lot of the driving force there was alcohol. Yeah. right and uh, with a lot of like just the abuse and violence and how we treated each other and all of that and up until then i had a sister-in-law who had been asking us to go to church and i was i was just really rude or you know like <laughs> don't bring that over here yeah. <laughs> you know like nobody wants that and so and she was very persistent you know um, so that was on the back end so here i go to one of my emt shifts we're starting over and um, I, you, when you're an EMT, you have one partner for six months on end, and then you know you do a, like a lottery thing, and you get another partner. So you're working with the same person for six months. Like you really get to know each other, and how, right? It's just two of you on the ambulance. Uh, so I show up to work, and my partner's out, and they're like, "Hey, we assigned you." There's a sub that came in. I don't even know the kid. He's like this 19 year old kid. I was so annoyed, like, oh, it's going to be the worst shift ever. Like, I, I was so vocal about just being awful. But I'm telling him, like, just do what I tell you to do, you know, like, don't get in my way type of situation. Uh, so we post up when we're waiting for a call over by Glendale Memorial, like up on a hill. And this kid starts talking to me about God. And we're in an ambulance like a co confined space you can't go nowhere i can't go anywhere <laughs> I love nowhere it. <laughs> and we're on a 12-hour shift yeah right <laughs> and so usually i bring my ipad my headphones a book something to yeah. keep myself busy till we get a call right yeah. 
So we're sitting up on this hill and he starts talking about God and I'm like cussing this kid out. I'm like, I don't know. I don't do that. Like, I don't want to know about God. I don't believe in God. Like, I'm just digging into him and he's like calm and, you know, just real chill. Um, and I, I'm like 30. He's like 19. I had zero respect for, I just was a whole another yeah. level of a person. And um, he starts sharing his testimony with me. And he's just having a conversation. It just, the way he shared God, like nobody in my life ever had. Yeah. Right? He was just talking to me, sharing the testimony part. Like, I was very intrigued by that. Nobody mm -hmm. knew what I had been through ever. Yeah. Right? Never told anyone. It was like this dark, dark secret. My husband didn't know. Nobody knew. Yeah. And so he started sharing his life. And I was like, wow, like this kid's been through some stuff. Because in my head, I was like, what can this 19-year-old really have been through, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was in this victim mentality. I was a professional victim for a really long time. And it was always this, like, nobody's been what I've, you know, they've yeah. been through what I've been through or hasn't Nobody had knows. it. Nobody knows. Or, you know, it hasn't been as bad. Like, I just was stuck there. <clears throat> and so he's talking about his life and just sharing God. He has a Bible in his backpack. He pulls out his Bible. And I, I promise you, like, I remember it was like a full probably like vampire situation where I was like, you know, like <laughs> hissing at the Bible. And, and I was so, and I remember just going like this, like I was, like I, I was, I don't know if I was afraid of it or just, it just was so foreign to me. Yeah. I was like, why does this person have a Bible in his backpack? I was so confused. And he just was holding it. Like he didn't even open it. And he was just holding it, talking about his life and the things he had been through. He had like an alcoholic dad, like all these things. Um, and then at some point I found myself telling this kid like all of my problems. Wow. And I and I'd never done that in my life. Like I had yeah. never I never gone to therapy. I had never I never unpacked. Like I was yeah. just too, you know, I was over here like I'm too, you know, I'm too hard for that. Yeah. Like people don't do that. And so I start telling him about how like my husband and I had just separated and like all these things and like some hardships, still nothing about the trafficking. But I'm like sharing, I was very vulnerable with this kid who I just met. I don't know, you know, I, I at work. At work. I just met him that morning. And then anyway, fast forward that we ended up sitting in that ambulance for 12 hours. We never got one call, which is really wow. crazy. Like, we never got one call. We sat up on that hill and just talked. At the end of that shift, he's crying. I'm crying. He lays hands on me and prays over me. I never in my life had anybody do that. Wow. Never. Like, and the way that he prayed, I just had never heard anything like that before. You know, it was one of those, like, you know, how does he know exactly what to pray for yeah. type of thing. And I was so moved. I was, like, sobbing. And I don't even remember the last time I had cried like that, but now I know that was like the Holy Spirit in, in the space, but mm -hmm. I just could not even contain myself. Mm -hmm. And he prayed, the way he prayed over me was just, he was like, God is going to use you. Like your marriage is going to be restored. Like he prayed life over me. Like, and all that rings true today. And I was, that was a decade ago. And and I, it was crazy because whatever he prayed for me, like I believed him. Yeah. I believed him. Just the conviction, the authority, the gentleness. It was, it was Jesus. You know, like he really showed me the love of God. For the first time in my life, I was 30 years old. And I came off that shift and I texted my husband, I think I want to go to church next weekend. And he probably wow. almost fell out of his chair and he texted me like, babe, are you okay? What's going on? Like what? <laughs> you know, um, and like I said, my sister-in-law had been inviting us and I was always declining that invite. And I just, I just was so moved. And, and I realized that my job was, you know, a big stressor in my marriage I worked like 99% males and it just a lot of the things um, with cheating and all that had gone on there and so I was like okay I need to drop this like I can do something else so I quit well I quit maybe a couple weeks later but that kid I never saw him again 
Wow. I tried to look for him on social media and I couldn't find him. And even to this day, I'm just like, like I wish he knew how much he, you know, like changed my life. So we went to church the next weekend. Uh, my sister-in-law was attending Shepherd Church with her boyfriend at the time. And uh, it, was, it wasn't as big as it is now, right? It was the smaller building. We go, I'm terrified. I haven't been in church in like over 15 years. Mm. My husband hasn't been in church. You know, we, we have two toddlers. And so we're like, okay, here we go. And so I go to church and the first sermon we ever hear, my husband and I, we're probably a couple weeks into tearing up the divorce papers, starting over, trying different things to restore our marriage. I quit my job as an ENT, trying to figure out what to do with my life. Um, Pastor Dudley preaches on the sanctity of marriage. First sermon we ever heard. So, you know, my husband and I are sitting there like, did somebody tell this pastor about our life? You know, like, what is happening right now? Um, it just wanted, it was one of those just yeah. in your face kind of undeniable experiences. And I remember he had everybody stand up and take our wedding rings off and place them on the Bible. And like, it was like a vow renewal. Mm -hmm. And I was just done. At that point, I was like, <laughs> done. Um, but I had- In a good way. In a good way. Like, but I, I had felt something, you know, mm -hmm. in that ambulance. I had experienced something that I couldn't explain. And I was a very factual person mm -hmm. I was very like no nope, I need to see it you can't prove it like it was yes. like I needed to have all these things and here I was up against something that I couldn't explain um, but that I could feel so deeply yeah. in my soul um, that I felt like I needed you know it felt like I just needed to be there and from that moment on we just kept going to church and I went on this women's retreat uh, and it's the first time I ever said out loud everything that had happened to me, a like, hundred women up on a mountain. And that's really where I, I met God. Like I experienced him in a radical way. Now I know the ambulance situation was a divine appointment. Um, mm -hmm. And I just fell on my face, you know, up on that mountain. And, and I said all those things and I just gave all that guilt and that shame and all the stuff. I just left it there. And I came back down just on fire, on fire for God, for healing, for restoration. And he really brought that full circle for me. You know, like my husband, we we were so plagued by there's so many things that are residuals of that life, you know, and both of us had this alcohol addiction. We had a pornography addiction. Nobody talks about that. That's so real. And just the way that that consumes you and your life and me as a woman even, I had a full pornography addiction, you know, and it is a lot of residual of being in that life and the things you experience. And so, I mean, what we tried to do, my husband and I, in our own strength for a decade, which was a fail, man, God cleaned that up and tied it with a shiny bow and like <laughs> just put his kiss on it in what felt like an instant, you know? And, and it's work. I mean, there, there had to be full surrender and obedience and like all these things that come with it. But we were we were here for it, you know, and we were ready for it. And I'm just so grateful that I have a husband who who's riding that crazy ride with me and who loves God as much as I love God. And we're raising our kids up that way. But like my life was just never the same. And God really started to unpack and to heal and um I was able to sit down with my husband that only 2016, which wasn't that long ago. Yeah, that's, that's the street. first time I ever told my husband about my whole life. Wow. And we've been together since 2005. So there was, so we finally, had, and that was a whole other situation. Like God just was everywhere. You know, we, we were both listening to, you know, on the drives, you listen to the radio. We yeah. listen to focus on the family and like family life today, which were, an hour apart and so on his drive he listened to one and on my drive I'd listen uh, but it just so happened one week I was listening in on the show and there was a survivor that was sharing of trafficking 
and she was talking about how you have to share it with the people you love and like all this stuff and I was so scared and I was listening to that all week and I was so convicted and on the other end my husband was listening to another show on his drive that was talking about adultery and pornography addiction and all that things wow. that he had struggled with that we never shared with each yeah, other never talked about. and that weekend we both just ended up on like we need to talk no and the kids went away for the weekend and we unpacked all the things and it was really hard you know you have to go through a lot of healing yeah. and things like that from disclosing that kind of information um and god knew that we weren't ready for that a decade earlier you know we were really in this position of healing and having god in our hearts and in our minds and he had renewed a lot in us and we were able to receive that information and meet each other with love and compassion and empathy and forgiveness and just all the beautiful things that god gives but um and then our marriage just was brand new and like never the same and we've just been writing for god ever since and god full circled it for me and sent me back to that mountain a couple years later to give a testimony on true worth and you know to to on forgiveness and all the things and the first time i ever shared my story in public was at shepherd church which is still my home church and man i, I couldn't even be where i'm at without that community and just how much they rallied around me and really helped me through that healing process and that's the first time i shared it they did a freedom prayer night and i was one of the speakers and it's the first time i had said out loud do you do you still remember that young man's name i re i remember his last name i don't remember his first name now i used to remember it so much time passes his last name was yeah. melendez uh, i think his first name was justin maybe yeah yeah what an, what an, an incredible young man yeah. to be led of the Lord um, at the right time and the setup of God. You ain't going to know it for 12 hours. You're going to be in the mountain and this young kid is just going to be the forerunner. This is, this is the kid that God uses yeah. to start a new life. I mean, just, you know, whatever he said to you, broken and, broken. and 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 the other thing that i gotta i gotta take note of is you know prior to this guy all the rest of the guys that you have been surrounded by were no good no good they, they, they were opportunists they were slimy no goods and god brings this young little 19 year old kid to share the gospel with you yeah and the door is open. My goodness, man. And it's so telling of how much God loves us and knows yeah. us each individually and just knows our innermost workings and what we're going to respond to yeah. and what, you know, like just the, that whole setup. I was like, because that kid could have talked any other kind of way. Yeah, He, he could have threw that Bible at me and he could have, yeah. you know, there could have been so many other ways. Or, or not been, he, he could have not been bold and, and said, you know, because at first you said God isn't real. But yeah, 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 yeah. Like, cut it out. Yeah. He could have easily just said, oh, "Okay, I'm sorry." You know, I might lose my job. Kind of just not say nothing, and then that's it. But the bonus that God gives gives this young man, um, here we sit. Here we sit. <laughs> you know, um, I know that you're involved as we uh, we're about to land the plane here. I want to promote something that you uh, are involved in, and that's uh, Beauty for Ashes. And it's a, ca a campaign. What, what do you do with this campaign? Yes, yeah, so that is fairly new. It's my campaign. It's something that God put on my heart uh, this past summer. And um, it's really, I'm using it to bring hope and restoration and to fill the need. You know, a lot of what traffickers do is they just fill a need. There's vulnerabilities, there's needs that all of these at-risk youth and families and communities have and they come and they fill that need um, so a lot of people don't know this but uh, beauty services and products is a driving force in how traffickers can lure girls to become victims and also for girls 
who have already been in the life to go out and sell themselves. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of it, just even things like hair and nails and makeup and eyelashes, um, that's something that if there's that need, they'll go out and willing to sell their bodies or traffickers are like, go do this and I'll get your nails done and I get so all of that. Um, so in working with the youth, I just was seeing that need so much and you know, we get donations and things like that, but honestly, they're not their donations and a lot of it sometimes isn't good quality and I know people mean well and they have good intentions, but the girls know when they're getting dollar store things, you know, mm -hmm. and even as a former foster youth, like we got just crappy products all mm -hmm. the time because yeah. it, and it people don't realize how much that enforces like your worth and your value and what somebody's already told you that you're not worth much yeah. and that you're not worthy of good things and all of that. And so when we receive those things, it, it really just magnifies that. And it's not a good feeling, you know? A lot of the times they give us trash bags to carry our things from foster home to foster home. Like that's where your stuff is, yeah. you know? And so there's all these little details yeah. that people don't realize are are really pushing that same agenda that the traffickers have established. And, and I saw I saw this video that you put up on, on your Instagram where you open your, the trunk to your vehicle and these there's these care packages that you put together and it's those the hygiene and, yeah. and a towel and, and, and it's so presentable. It's so like well thought through, you could tell. And one of the things that got my attention was every, every kid has a Bible in there. Every kid has a Bible. And I sat there and I, I, I looked at this and I went, man, something this simple yet because the presentation it brings value yeah to the, and now i see why you do that and why it's important for folks to think think, think through things through and be more thorough in, in in their approach if you're listening to me if you're listening to this, this conversation to this testimony uh, sandy's uh, testimony I want you to, to be very, very prayerful. And I want you to, uh, in, a, in a second here, uh, I want her to share how our listeners can join in and support you in, in, this, uh, in, in this campaign that you have, because it's important. You know, these young girls, they're victims, and that's all they've known is, you know, little little grocery bags, little plastic bags, with no thought put into what they're putting in there. And, that, and, and you saying that this, this is a connection of what they're worth. And here you are uh, doing this on, on your own and, and, and we need to help. How can our listeners help you? Where do they go to donate or how, how do we make this happen for you? Yeah, so um, what it'll be is uh, creating beauty bags. And again, they will have that dignity behind it where yeah. they're not getting it in a plastic bag or anything like that. Um, and they are specifically beauty products. So uh, the mission of it and the vision of Beauty for Ashes is that no girl or woman ever has to feel like she has to sell her body for beauty again. And even if we can stand in that gap, for a short time while they're healing or finding restoration, um, providing them the, the products that they need because every woman deserves to feel beautiful. That's one of the first things that a trafficker will strip you of yeah. is your beauty, yeah. you know? And so, um, so yes, they can go to uh, at Beauty for Ashes One, that's where on PayPal where you can donate. And then I'll also have a link on my Instagram at the Sandy Esparza. If you're listening to us right now, um, let's help Beauty for Ashes and let's get as many kids possible through your donations to the link that you just shared with us and, um, and, and, and let's, let's, let's do something. Let's not just fold our hands 
and we we just enjoyed a great you know testimony and a great episode here on, on the Shop Dollar Podcast. Let's go beyond that, and let's be proactive in helping uh, Sandy here with Beauty for Ashes. I, I think it's important that we just you know when the church comes together, when believers come together, then we we are a force. We are a force that is alive and that can help. And and it's important that we get behind ministries like, like what she has right now and, and, and really uh, uh, let's make a dent in, in that arena. Um, I think we could do it. There's so many of you that, that listen to me and, and you know, this is why we exist. God has given us this platform on this podcast and uh, the reason why we bring the interviews that we do here, the ministries that come through here, uh, it, it's just tremendous stories. And I, I, I bet all the, all the, uh, you know, I, I don't just bring anybody in here. I want to make sure that these people that I bring to you, to your ear, are legit, they're real, and they're actually doing something in their communities. Their hands on, their hands are in the plow. They don't look back. They are in the plow, in the kingdom, and, and they're pushing uh, to, do, to make a difference in the lives of others in, in, well, in areas that they have survived through. Uh, Sandy, what are your parting words to our listeners? And what would you like to say? You can do something. Everybody can do something. And, and I'm sure you've heard this before. We can't do everything, but everyone can do something. And a lot of that does start with education and awareness. And, you know, I've been on the rescue and restoration end of this uh, for a couple years. And uh, I'm even transitioning into prevention more and education in this because being the cleanup crew is hard. Yeah. And getting to the root of this, it, it revolves around prevention. And there's so many things that we can do to stand in front of this so that no youth, no boy or girl or adult ever has to experience this. Because it's a lifelong journey, the yeah. healing and the restoration part, it's gut-wrenching. And especially if you don't have God, man, you even stand a chance, you yeah. know? Um, so I just wanna encourage you to be proactive to make noise if you need education if you need awareness i got you hit me up it's what i do um you know i also work at another nonprofit, the power project and we go out into all of southern california and we do prevention training for youth for staff for adults for parents for everybody we're just trying to be in these streets and make sure that we're giving our communities a fighting chance giving them the tools that they need to protect themselves, each other, and their children. And that's really how it starts. So if you need it, I got what you need. Um, please don't hesitate to contact me also, and we can just keep making noise. I think being loud is where it's at, and I'm thankful that God gave me the, the boldness and the lungs for that. So I'm here for it, and I hope you guys can show up too. Amen. You know, and, and the other thing that Sandy Sparza does is uh, she does uh, speaking engagements. If you're a pastor and um, you have a platform for her, uh, I want you to pray about inviting her and educating your church and having her speak at uh, an event. Um, we need to make a difference, and this is how it starts. Uh, the testimonies that God has given us um, serve a purpose. And that's to um, bring hope to somebody that perhaps feels that there's more hope left. And we know, you and I know, that there is hope. And that Amen. hope is found only in Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. Thank you so much, Sandy, for your time and your, your willingness, your story. Uh, I know that didn't land on bad soil. I know it's landing on good soil as we speak. And uh, keep making a difference. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't grow weary while doing good. Because in due season, you're gonna reap a harvest. I, I already know that. And I see it, I see the commitment in your eyes. I see the, the love of Christ. 
uh, in your face and, and, and I know that you're making a difference and um, I'm thankful for people like you that having lived through that that kind of hardship they don't remain quiet that that is amazing and so thank you for what God has put in your heart keep doing that thank you keep thank doing you for that. having me Los Angeles and those outside of this country that listen to us. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode. Make sure that you pass this episode all over the country and outside of the country. Let's bring that awareness uh, to the forefront. And, and you know what I'm about to say, because we never, ever, ever close this program until we remind you to put Jesus first. Thank you so much.